Hi, my name is Rachel and welcome back to Oxheart Gardening. Today is the week 12 garden tour, I believe. And today we are finally seeing some switching out of crops in the garden. This is just the very beginning of it, but it is the beginning of a lot more to come. So if you're new here, I am gardening here in upstate South Carolina. This is zone 7B, but it is right on the edge of zone 8. It is very humid here, and uh, I planted this garden right behind me on May 28th, and today is August 26th. So this garden just has entirely exploded over the whole summer, and every single week that I come back to look at it, well, I look at it every day, but like I see it through the lens of this garden tour that I shoot every week, and I am just amazed over and over by how well it has done and especially seeing as I put this in in a hurry right after I moved here to this spot, like literally a week before I put it in. So I normally like to go in the same order every week. So we are gonna start over here with my tomato row. So here on the end, I have tomatoes and as sort of a natural fence, I planted sunflowers along the edge and you can see the sunflowers are kind of petering out at this point. A lot of them have dropped their flowers or their petals and some of them are starting to kind of crisp up. So this area is looking a little less dense than it did before, but the tomatoes are looking as lush as ever. And I continue to pick so many tomatoes every single time that I come down here. Um, additionally, I pick a ton of these um, pole beans. These are blue cocoa pole beans. And I only have three plants on this whole entire row. But like these alone would be enough to keep me in fresh eating beans all the time. However, if we look at the other side of the tomatoes, we still see this lush, hardly crossable path. On this side are the eggplants, which I am continuing to harvest from. I think this Nagasaki Long is a little more prolific than the Antigua, which is the stripy one. But both of them have been making quite a few eggplants for me, and I've had to give quite a few away. Ooh, these marigolds. Right, so on this close side is Amish paste tomatoes and on the far side are my San Marzonos. And I haven't seen a huge difference in the production of either variety, although I have not been measuring. So it's super difficult to tell exactly how much of each I'm getting. Um, I do think that the Amish pastes are coming out bigger than the San Marzonos, but um, the tomatoes themselves are coming out with about the same number of tomatoes each. Um, and so far, I haven't really developed a preference for either. Um, I think they're both really great. I've made sauce with both of them and uh, neither one of them seems to have any more issues than the other in terms of growing. Um, so really in the future I'll probably still be growing both of these and uh, making sauce and salsa from both of these tomatoes. I do think moving forward though that I need to be better about making sure that the aisles of my garden are crossable because a lot of this is just me kind of like very carefully stepping in between plants that have grown across each other and trying not to step on any of the fruit that I'm trying to harvest and um, while it looks really lush and beautiful on camera it is not the most practical garden to be working with um, so I need to make some adjustments for next year to kind of account for how big all of these plants get because even though I have planted them with enough space to grow, I have not planted them with enough space for them to grow and then also for me to get in between them very easily. My pepper patch has been doing incredibly well. I've been harvesting sweet peppers out of this for a few weeks now and even though I had a lot of trouble with sunburn, on the ones that ended up in this area where the plants kind of fell apart from each other. For the most part, the peppers I'm getting are beautiful and unblemished and just like gorgeous, delicious peppers. Now, I will say, if I turn around, I have a pile of um, 
peppers that were a little rotten when I picked them and I wasn't able to take them to the compost bin. And by wasn't able, I mean in too much of a rush and carrying too many things out of the garden to think about it. Um, but yeah, don't think that I'm not getting dud peppers, that I'm not getting some that are getting eaten and then like going to mush before I can even pick them. I would say that happens to about maybe every one in 10 peppers that I'm picking. So while a vast majority of them are still great, um, you know, about 10% of them are still inedible and gross and mushy and feeding the garden for next year and not necessarily feeding me. So while some of my sunflowers are kind of on the small side, I do have some along the back here that are a little bit bigger and I think we'll be making seeds that are like big enough to worry about eating. So now that this sunflower in particular has dropped its petals and is kind of leaning over, I think it's time to put a bag over it so that it can make its seeds and the birds don't <laughs> steal them from me. I never get tired of cute little bee butts in my sunflowers though. So even though I tried really hard, squash bugs were still a problem. Um, you can see them gathering on this pumpkin here. Um, and you can see that the majority of the pumpkin vine is kind of ravaged by these squash bugs. Um, and I just found at the end of the day that I could not keep up with it. So in the future, I'll have to work a little bit more on uh, making sure that the right predator insects are present in the garden because there's only so much I can do. And uh, if I can, I would rather just leave it alone and have the predator insects take care of the majority of the population for me. But uh, probably I'm not quite there yet with the balance of everything. And that's just gonna take time. But things I can do to reduce the population that exists in the coming year are make sure that I get all of my squash, like plant dead matter out of the garden because that is where the squash bugs want to overwinter. So I'm going to make sure that that is like in the center of my compost pile, like breaking down really fast, bokashied so that it is not a good place for these squash bugs to overwinter and the population isn't quite as entrenched in this area, hopefully. So I have not, been keeping up with harvesting my green beans. Uh, you can see that there are quite a few large ones. And at this point, I am waiting for them to grow up and become dried beans because I could not eat all these fresh beans. I could not even give away all the fresh beans. And honestly, I didn't actually have the time to pick all of these fresh beans. And so since I have so, so many of them. I'm hoping that they make good dried beans because in the past I haven't had enough room to grow enough beans to make it worth it to grow beans for dried beans. Um, so we'll see how these turn out. I have blue lake bush and uh, purple teepee. So if either of you, any of you have tried either of those as dried beans, let me know. And now that I've just said that, I have something to show you. These are bean sprouts. But Rachel, you just said that you had way too many green beans. I know, but here's my logic. So all of these plants are about to be spent. As soon as they get like ripe beans and you know, mature seeds, then they will die because the plants are done. And I have planted these on the trellis where the cucumbers used to be. No more cucumbers. And the idea is that once these are producing in about 50, 55 days, um, they will be the only source of green beans in the garden and they will be the right amount for fresh eating instead of being overwhelming. And these ones are just slightly crooked because I had my neighbor Alana over helping. She's nine and uh, you know, it doesn't really matter if the beans are in a row or not. They're gonna grow and they are definitely close enough to the trellis to latch on. So similarly, I am letting the noodle beans go to seed 
I have found actually that even if I wasn't letting them go to seed, a lot of the ones that would be like the right size are just a little tougher than they were at the beginning of the season. So I really don't have any regrets letting all of these get big and go to seed and eventually be done with this beautiful trellis of noodle beans. It's still a very lush garden, don't get me wrong, but it looks a little emptier than it did before. The back trellis is empty. Basically all of the squash has died off. As you can see, one side of my makeshift tomato trellis has fallen again. I'm not sure if I can keep these things trellised up in a reasonable manner. So what I've done is I pulled off every single tomato off of these plants, even the green ones. I'm going to make some green salsa with them and then I'm going to be grateful for anything else I get off of them that isn't rotten. <laughs> By the way, just notice this, this is 100% tomato hornworm damage. You can see how all the leaves have been eaten off and you can kind of just see the stick of a plant left behind. Also something that I thought was super interesting is if you look at the shape of these tomatoes, these are like kind of regular ball shaped tomatoes, right? But I didn't plant any tomatoes that are this shape. I only planted Amish paste and San Marzono. And while those are different types of oblong tomatoes, they are both oblong tomatoes. And so the fat tomatoes, I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know where they came from. Um, they are only in this section of poorly trellised tomatoes. And I don't think that that should have anything to do with it. The tomatoes over here are definitely smaller, like overall full stop, which I think is very interesting because they had the same nutrition. They just didn't have the same pruning. So my tomatoes that I pruned up on the trellis made much larger and are still making larger tomatoes than these ones that I have kind of neglected and poorly trellised. And it's not a difference in watering. I don't water anything in the garden right now uh, at all. I just let the rain do it and the, like, the only difference is the care that they got and the pruning and the trellising. So that's the only reason I can think of why they would be a different shape. My wild zinnia patches have not failed to disappoint. There have been so many colors of flower and while it's very overgrown, it has been very beautiful and it has attracted a lot of butterflies. So lastly in the corner of the garden, I have been picking corn and there's been some unfortunate pests with the corn. Uh, pretty much every single ear has had a caterpillar or caterpillar damage inside of it. And I'm not really sure what I need to do to prevent that in the future. Um, whether that is a picking them off kind of thing, or it is again, sort of a cultivating the right predators for them kind of thing. You can see and this one specifically has a hole all the way through the husk so it's not that they're getting in the top there it is something that is actually actively eating into them so something interesting with that corn is I've noticed it seems like there's a bunch of different varieties going on at first I thought it was going to be glass gem corn but I am pretty positive that at least one of those plants has been making like a strawberry popcorn type um, and the rest of them have been kind of white corn so I'm not the best at identifying popcorn types or corn in general for that matter because this is my first time growing corn, but I know that um, the person I got the seeds from definitely enjoys crossing their corn. So I think it's very likely that that is what has happened here. And I'm fully intending on trying to pop the stuff that I think is popcorn because why not? So my landlord has not been able to mow my lawn in a hot minute and uh, it is becoming a problem to walk through the grass over here. Um, so I'm going to skip this part of the tour this week, mostly because not a lot has changed 
and also because I am a slight bit of a rush today because of my recent life events. So I'll tell you a little bit about that while I show you my brand new brassica seedlings. Um, basically, my partner had tonsil surgery, tonsillectomy, last week, and this week he had some breakthrough bleeding, meaning that the surgery site, um, the scab popped off and he was basically bleeding a lot. That was an ER visit in the middle of the night and then a lot of waiting for the surgeon to actually be able to see him. And everything is fine now. He is doing a lot better. But um, I haven't really slept much in the last couple of days. Uh, I just, I couldn't not film the garden tour for you guys. Oh, look, it is the furry supervisor. One of them, this is Kada. She doesn't go outside much these days. I think she's a little afraid of um, the other feral cats that are out there. So yeah, the um, pepper tasting video is still in the plans, but probably a little farther off than I initially thought um, because it'll still be, we have set back on recovery. So it'll still be another two weeks or maybe longer until he is back up to eating spicy foods and stuff like that. Um, so we want to be very careful with that. And if you guys have made it to the end of this video, thank you. Um, that was not the secret. The secret is that Krista, who has been in videos before, is going to do a pickle tasting video with me coming up. And I think it's gonna be incredibly fun. So stay tuned for that. And that is all I have to show for you today. So thank you guys so much for watching. Hopefully I will be on time with a full garden tour next Wednesday. Fingers crossed, <laughs> nothing else goes wrong. But um, until I see you again, I wish you all happy gardening.